The Pac-12 is as good as dead at the time of recording this video. I do not see how the four remaining schools stay together under the Pac-12 moniker and save their beloved conference. The proud conference on the West Coast once had the largest television deal in the country over a decade ago. Many would have laughed in your face if you told them that that deal would be the last deal the conference would sign as it expires at the end of this coming season. It seemed like this conference would never fail or fall apart. But the conference did fail. But why did it fail? This is the story of the Pac-12, the rise and fall of the West Coast's strongest conference. But before we get into this, if you enjoy college football content like this, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. I'm planning to release a video every day for the month of August. Also, what do you think caused the death of the Pac-12 conference? Let me know in the comment section below. The Pac-12 conference dates back to December 2nd, 1915, when the founders of the Pacific Coast Conference met and formed the conference at a meeting in the Imperial Hotel in Portland, Oregon. Ironically, the original members consisted of four schools. The University of California, located in Berkeley, California, aka Cal, the University of Washington, the University of Oregon, and Oregon Agriculture College, now known as Oregon State. The conference began playing football in 1916, and in 1917, they added Washington State College, now Washington State University, and in 1918, added Stanford University. The conference would expand to eight teams in 1922, with the additions of USC and the University of Idaho. Then came Montana in 1924 and UCLA in 1928, bringing the members up to 10 total schools. The first league's commissioner was named in 1940 to be Edward N. Antherton and was succeeded by Victor O. Schmidt in 1944. In 1950, Montana resigned from the conference and in 1958, the conference was dissolved and replaced by the Athletic Association of Western Universities, aka the AAWU. The conference was disbanded due to a major crisis and scandal. Washington head coach John Sherberg was linked to a slush fund money used to pay players. The PCC found evidence of the prohibited activities of the Greater Washington Advertising Fund run by Roscoe C. Torchy Torrance and imposed sanctions. Torrance wrote in his book, It's a fact in life that kids can't be a college athlete and make it through school without outside help if he's in any need at all. That's why there has been a fund like ours at almost every university. Throughout the history of the conference, USC, Oregon, and UCLA were all found to be guilty of illegal funds. Five of the nine members formed the AAWU, being California, Washington, UCLA, Southern California, and Stanford, with Washington State joining in 1962, and both Oregon and Oregon State joining in 1964. Thomas J. Hamilton was named the conference's commissioner at its inception, and the conference would go on to be named the Pacific Eight Conference in 1968. The conference became known as the Pac-8 in 1971. Ten years later, on July 1st, 1978, the University of Arizona and Arizona State University were admitted to the league and the Pacific 10 Conference became a reality. The league added 10 women's sports in 1986 to 1987 and has since become known as the Premier League in Women's Athletics, capturing NCAA titles consistently in those sports. Thomas C. Hansen was named the commissioner of the Pac-10 in 1983 a role he would hold for 26 years until 2009. Hansen was viewed as a controversial figure throughout his tenure. Ken Goh from Oregon Live wrote back in September of 2020, I know I'm in the minority and revealing my age, but I thought Tom Hansen did a good job as conference commissioner. Hansen knew the conference, he knew the people at the schools and the ones in the athletic department, not just at the presidential level. He understood the NCAA and how to operate effectively within it. He was genuine and folksy, he even flew commercial. On the other hand, Matt Zemeck from the Trojan Wire wrote, From 1983 through 2009, the Pac-10 won one outright national title, USC in 2004. Washington with 19, in 1991 and USC in 2003 won split national titles. The BCS was something Tom Hansen loved, yet it didn't do anything for the Pac-10. In Hansen's 11 seasons on the job during the BCS from 1998 to 2008, the Pac-10 only had two at-large bids for BCS bowl games. Oregon State in 2001's Fiesta Bowl versus Notre Dame, and USC in the 2003 Orange Bowl versus Iowa. According to some, under Hansen, the Pac-12 was viewed as the fourth best conference behind the SEC, Big Ten, and Big 12. It was viewed that way because the ACC's premier teams, Clemson, Miami, and Florida State, were all down during that time period. Larry Scott took over for Hansen as the Pac-10 commissioner. The Pac-10 presidents looked outside their industry to hire Scott, who was the CEO of the Women's Tennis Association, and Scott's goal 
raised the profile of a proud conference long hindered by its time zone and outdated TV contract. Scott was a slick talker who made headlines and wowed people immediately. He almost brought Texas and Oklahoma into the Pac-12 from the Big 12, which would have made the Pac a 16-team league with the additions of Utah and Colorado. The reason that fell apart was because Texas did not want to give up any of their revenue from their Longhorn network, and the Pac-12 was unwilling to make a special exception for one school. Because Texas wasn't coming, that also meant Oklahoma was not joining either. Scott then stunned the college football world when he was able to lure ESPN and Fox into a bidding war with Comcast that quadrupled the league's previous annual TV revenue. Stuart Mandel from The Athletic wrote earlier this week, From that point forward, the presidents, led by Scott's principal champion, Arizona State's Michael Crow, gave him anything he wanted. And what he wanted was to launch a media company that he would run for a pricey salary, eventually $5.3 million a year. While Scott wowed the Pac-12 presidents, reporters felt that he was all smoke. He cared about the image he presented. He moved the offices from the suburban office park to downtown San Francisco and into some of the priciest areas on the West Coast. He flew charter and gave the reporters a feeling of a used car salesman. Scott launched the Pac-12 network without a proven media partner like ESPN or Fox. They had a weird seven channel model that never caught on and never came close to matching the projected revenue figures. Remember, as a kid, it was impossible to find the Pac-12 games on the East Coast because of the Pac-12 network. And all I wanted to do was watch Oregon in their cool uniforms. The Athletic recounted last year, the league in 2015 had a deal in hand to finally get the network on DirecTV. And the presidents, led by Crow, rejected it. The same conference that hosted College Game Day for a matchup between number 3 Stanford and number 6 Oregon in that very same year saw three of their teams finish ranked in the top six, only a few years later had their top programs in dysfunctional states. USC had had a tough decade plus after the departure of Pete Carroll in 2009 until the arrival of Lincoln Riley. Stanford leveled off and Oregon and Washington showed signs of being dominant national programs but were not consistent. UCLA, Colorado, and the Arizona schools spent most of the decade in mediocrity. Utah played very well towards the end of the 2010s and into the early 2020s, winning the conference multiple times. The conference failing to produce a college football playoff entrant for six consecutive seasons and counting did immense damage to its national brand. So did a 1-8 bowl record in 2017 and one non-conference faceplant after another. Throughout this time period, top West Coast talent also began leaving for schools like Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, and Ohio State. Scott didn't help the league's image as he stood by his general counsel, Woody Dixon, who overruled an in-game official review stayed at an almost $10,000 hotel suite during the conference basketball tournament in Vegas and took a $2.2 million bonus shortly before laying off or furloughing half the conference's staff in 2020. The Pac-12 presidents allowed things like this to continue until 2021, when he was replaced by George Klaivkoff, the then president of entertainment and sports at MGM Resorts International in Vegas. But not before Scott pocketed more than $50 million himself. The Pac-12 network was a flop going back to 2014, as the Pac-12 was reaching only 11 million paying subscribers compared to the 57 million paying for the Big Ten network. The Pac-12 schools are facing a $50 million fiasco after Comcast overpaid for the Athletic Conference Regional Sports Network. The company realized it was overcharged for licensing fees from 2012 to 2016. This is why it will be hard for the Pac-12 to merge with a conference like the Mountain West, because no conference wants to be responsible for this debt. Klaivkoff had no idea what type of mess he was walking into when he arrived at the Pac-12 headquarters. Distrust, unpaid bills, and just a few weeks into his job in July of 2021, massive upheaval across college sports. When Oklahoma and Texas left the Big 12 for the SEC, many thought that was going to be the death of the Big 12 and the Pac-12 would be able to grab schools like TCU, Baylor, and Oklahoma State, or maybe grab BYU, San Diego State, or Boise State to bolster their ranks. Instead, they did nothing. They stood pat and entered a handshake deal with the ACC and Big Ten called the Alliance. Clive Koff pushed for the expansion of the playoffs, but voted against the model that was presented, which delayed the expansion to 2024 instead of this season. Then came the first major blow to the conference. USC and UCLA announced their decision to leave the Pac-12. The reason for this departure goes back to the Larry Scott days, but at that point, Clive Koff had failed at his one job negotiate a lucrative enough television deal to keep the conference together. Things began to look bad for the conference when the Big 12 was able to get their own conference deal done to keep their conference together with the additions of UCF, Cincinnati, BYU, and Houston. 
The Big 12 brought in WME Sports and IMG Media to negotiate their deal. They did this two years before their contract expired and took up potential time slots with ESPN and Fox. The Big 12 schools were also set to make $31.7 million per school. The Pac-12, on the other hand, were struggling to get a deal done. Klaivkoff and his advisors reported open talks with ESPN and Fox, asking for entirely unrealistic numbers, closer to the SEC's payment than the Big 12. They hoped that the California Board of Regents would block UCLA's move to the Big 10. Klaivkoff also chose to focus on finding the television deal first before adding new schools. The worst part of it all, though, was the Pac-12 hired a boutique firm and sports media advisors run by Doug Perlman, who was a classmate of Klaivkoff's back in the day. With the ship filling with water quickly, Klaivkoff bought time for himself by saying in December that the deal was delayed because he felt Colorado hiring Deion Sanders would raise the conference's value. The truth was, Klaivkoff never actually had a deal in place the members' institutions would approve. When Colorado announced their departure, Klaivkoff was about to present the network's final offer. He genuinely believed he was going into the room Tuesday, presenting a unique offer from Apple, by which the members would make far more than their Big 12 counterparts if they met certain subscription thresholds, and everyone would rush to sign a new grants of rights deal. These were the same schools that were screwed by Scott when he presented the same type of model when it came to the Pac-12 network a decade earlier. That's when the dam finally broke for the Pac-12. According to many, no school remaining in the Pac-12 wanted to be the reason the conference fell apart. Oregon loved the idea of being the big dog in a smaller conference and hoped the Pac-12 would stay together, and Arizona State and Utah did not want to go to the Big 12. But at the end of the day, they needed to look out for their future of their programs and athletics, and there was a rope thrown to them that they felt they had to take. Now, Stanford, Cal, Oregon State, and Washington State are left without a conference. Debt left by Comcast over payments, and a conference that is on their deathbed. A conference that had 22 national championships in football, 553 national championships in team sports, and 2,246 national championships across all sports, male and female, team and individual awards. While many will point to the greed of why the Pac-12 fell apart or other conferences, the real cause of death is the failure of those in leadership positions, from the commissioner to the university presidents, because of their arrogance and incompetence. The dam began leaking when Larry Scott was commissioner, and he got away with everything. By the time George Klaivkoff came into the position, he needed to play everything perfectly, which he was unable to do, and the dam broke. I do not know what's going to happen to the Pac-12. All I do know is, it's been sad to watch it fall apart. What do you think? What caused the death of the Pac-12 conference, and what do you think the remaining schools do? Let me know in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out one of my other videos YouTube thinks you will love right here. Don't forget to leave a like and to subscribe for more college football content. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, remember to embrace the grind.